We still have time. <laughs> we still have time. Yes, you have five, five minutes. Plenty of time. I guess it's Friday afternoon. People already left for hiking. Uh, there's nothing. <laughs> there's nothing after you. So. Right. So that's why I think that people already left. Well, although it's not. I don't know if you've been outside lately. But it's I not, was. It's I was. We were soaked with Greg. Hiking. Well, but they probably <laughs> drive somewhere. This national park is, is really unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, I heard it may snow up in the mountains. This, this weekend? weekend? Oh. Yeah, which is very late. We were snow. there a week ago, my wife and I. I think I told you we came yeah, here for a week. And it was raining the week before. And we... <coughs> to the point that we almost canceled the vacation. Um, and, well, a few weeks before, we called the road was still closed. And they told us that they hoped that they will be able to close mm -hmm. because going all the way to the top is really special. Yeah, it's been very wet and cold late into the not, spring. I gotta say, year. not for us. We were there for a week. It was perfect. We oh, came here. Good. They said every way, every day there was a little bit, but it didn't bother me at all. Yeah, yeah we had mm. snow in late May. How bad does it get here in the winter? I mean, it's not that bad. I mean, it's it's when it's not snowing, it's sunny. So, especially, we get a lot of, it's drier in January and February. We get some snow in December, and then snow again in March, usually, into April. And by that time, there's so much sunlight, that as soon as the snow stops, it all melts. So, it's not, uh, it's not any colder than the East Coast. There's not really that much more snow than the East Coast. Um, and it's sunnier. So... I think if you go east, out into the plains, you know, if you go out to Kansas or whatever, then the winters get worse. Maybe that's why there are Republicans there. <laughs> <laughs> because everyone else left? <laughs> you know, ha having you here, reminds me, just because you were talking about politics for a second, reminds me of something that you told me many, 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 many before, before you quote me. Taking notes? Yeah. It helps, it, it, it helps you concentrate? It helps me, yeah. It helps me sort of focus and be there and really listen. If I don't take notes and I'm like, oh yeah, I know this, and then suddenly I'm halfway through the talk and I have no idea. What's this going happened on, to me almost so. every talk. <laughs> <laughs> you could try notes. All right, that we can get started for the last lecture of the day. So, Nadi Seiberg will conclude his discussion of two plus one dimensional. Yeah, thank you. I guess some of you have already 
decided to go hiking, <laughs> no longer here, and they're being punished by the weather. <laughs> <laughs> so we finished last time with this celebrated particle vortex duality. So let me remind you our shorthand notation for everything. Not everything in here. And I'm going to write it. Everything on the right hand side has hats. So we abuse the notation here almost maximally. What we mean by the left hand side is a 5 4 theory coupled to a background U1 gauge field, big B. Remember, uppercase is classical and lowercase is dynamical. We are in Euclidean signature. We see that from the sign here. And we tune to an infrared fixed point. And the way we see it here, that there is no phi square, and we set the coefficient of phi to the fourth to be 1. On the right hand side, it's the same thing, except that there is a dynamical gauge field, little b hat. And it appears here in the covariant derivative. And again, we are in the infrared, and therefore we do not have a kinetic term for little b, because in the infrared, the gauge coupling goes to infinity, uh, so that the f square is absent. There is no quadratic term, because we tune to a fixed point. The coefficient here is 1, because this, this is an irrelevant operator, so we cannot dial it. And we make the assumption, which is supported by a lot of numerical evidence, that the two sides indeed have a 2D, a, 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 indeed have a critical point, conformal field theory at long distances. And finally, the same B that appears here, we need a hat here, the same B that appears on the right hand side, on the left hand side, appears also on the right hand side as it couples to a global U1 symmetry on the other side. And we also abuse the notation in the sense that this is a locally a form, and this is not. But if I declare that, then I think I'm covered legally. And we map the two theories to each other. And the monopole operator from here was mapped to phi from here, monopole of b hat. And the phi square from here was mapped to minus phi hat square to here. And we match the two phases. And the assumption that these two critical theories are dual to each other is known as particle vortex duality. So this is a summary of <coughs> what we did toward the end of uh, yesterday, in the end of my talk yesterday. And then we said that once we have one duality, we have a machine that produces others. So there are two things we can do. One, we can add classical terms to the two sides. Any terms of the form BDB with a K, and in Euclidean space there is an I over 4 pi, can be added to the two sides. That clearly doesn't change anything, because if the first duality is right, we just add classical terms, so the partition function has another phase uh, multiplying it. And the other thing we can do is once we have a coupling to a background field B here, we can sum over all possible background fields B. Because if the, end, if the thing before the sum is the same, the thing after the sum should be the same. These two operations are known as Witten's T and S operations. But we're not going to use the, the motivation that he had uh, in, the, in these lectures here. But when we sum over B, things are a little bit more subtle. So it looks intuitively clear, but things could be more subtle. It might, we have more coupling constants that we can add, and we might need to tune the additional couplings. And there might or might not be a second order phase transition. I'm going to ignore all that and assume that, well, first of all, it's clear that whatever phases we find here, we're going to find related phases after we do the operation. And second, there are more coupling constants. So I'm going to assume that we can always tune things to a non-trivial critical point. So that's going to be the assumption. 
And in most cases, this is a very mild assumption. And in some cases, perhaps it can be even tested numerically. And the, te the real test would be whether we land on our feet. And I have lectured in this room and in other places in this university in many tussies. And it's always the same spirit with the duality. We do what we can, we run some tests, and after a while, we get confidence in it. So we'll continue with the same spirit. So the first thing I'm going to do, I'll start manipulating this thing. So let's first add this thing with k equals 1. So I'm going to do it very slowly here. So I'll, do, I'll gradually skip more and more steps as I do that. Fourth. So, so far I just copied. And now I'm adding to the two sides u1 level 1, but it's classical. So at this point, I don't even need the assumptions. And now I'm going to make b dynamical. And I'm going to do something which is very easy on the blackboard and a little bit harder in your notes. What does it mean to make b dynamical in my notation? So wherever I see b, I write lowercase b. By that, I mean that it's dynamical. And as I do that, I can add i over 2 pi, b, da, and a is an uppercase letter. That kind of, there's a new u1 symmetry, a magnetic symmetry for little b, which couples to a. So now I have to do the same thing on the right-hand side. So I'll do it with the eraser. So, so far it looks rather mild. And with the assumptions I said before, these two theories are still dual to each other. So now let me manipulate them. Yes? Uh, no, but there's a, this term. There's this term. There's u1 level one. We have a Chern Simons term. But I mean, on the right hand side, without the capacity, have that, right? No. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so what do we see on the left hand side first? What we see on the left hand side is a, an O2 model coupled to a u1 gauge field, little b. That was the content of your comment. But it's not quite the same dynamics because the U1 gauge field also has a churn simons term level 1. So this is a different theory. And in a few minutes, I'll tell you what it does at long distances. But so far, just a theory. Strongly coupled and it's some fixed point. What do we have on the right-hand side? Well, here we have some alphabet soup. We have this phi hat, and it couples to b hat, and b hat couples to b, and b couples to itself, and it also couples to a background field. Okay. Now, the key point is that all these terms are quadratic in little b. So little b appears only here and nowhere else. So I can complete the square. And I can write that as i over 4 pi b plus b hat b plus b hat plus a d b plus b hat plus a and now I have to s subtract the mistake so the b b hat I already so the b square I already had it b b hat b b hat we already had and b a we already had so we just need this square so we have to subtract i over 4 pi b hat db hat minus i over 2 pi b hat da minus i over 4 pi a da and I hope I did not make a mistake. So that this thing replaces this. So I'm going to cross that out. 
Okay, now I hope you can. It's always easier to check algebra from afar. That's a general rule of nature. So now I'm going to change names and shift what I mean by B by this thing. I just give it another name. So what do we see here? This B appears only here. This is U1 level 1. And I hope that, sorry? B appears nowhere else. So the whole interaction of B, of little b, is just U1 level 1. It's a decoupled sector. So U1 level 1 is a very interesting Jordan Simons theory. It has two line operators, the identity line, so U1 level 1. It has the identity operator in a fermion line, operator of spin a half. It's a spin Chern Simons theory, it needs a choice of spin structure. And in the condensed matter literature, it's denoted this way. Because it has two lines, spin a half line and a spin zero identity line, trivial line. It has a framing anomaly. Was framing anomaly discussed? Yeah, so it has a framing anomaly, but for simplicity, let's ignore the framing anomaly. In fact, it's a lot of fun to keep track of the framing anomaly because everything I'm going to say will still be true if we keep track of the framing anomaly. But for simplicity, let's ignore that. So this is essentially a free theory, a decoupled trivial theory, almost trivial. So we cross that out. So what are we left with? On the left hand side, B does not couple to phi hat. That was crucial here. Here I can't do that because on this side, B does couple to phi. Yeah, but if you want to replace B hat in terms of like I did not touch B hat. I only touched B on the right hand side. Now that's a, I, I was very careful about that. The point of all these manipulations is that since I'm walking on very thin ice, I'm going to walk very slowly and carefully. So with your permission, I'm going to really use the eraser so that we'll not clutter the equations <laughs> instead of copying it. And we derive a new duality. So let me copy this here. Minus i over 4 pi bdb with a hat minus i over 2 pi b hat da minus i over 4 pi a da. Is there a, a good chalk here, the Japanese chalk, or only this thing? Sorry? <laughs> wow. Thank you. Thank you. I owe you one. <laughs> Is it your personal chalk? <laughs> Fantastic students here. <laughs> People with good taste. <laughs> this is surprising. Let me tell you why this is surprising. What do we see on the left hand side? We see a gauge, a, a, a gauge Wilson Fisher theory <coughs> with U1 level 1. Let's turn off A, the background A first. What we see on the right hand side is gauge Wilson Fisher theory with level minus 1. That's very surprising because the theory on the left hand side looks like it's not going to be time reversal invariant. Right? It's an interacting theory and it has some churn simons theory, some churn simons coupling with level non-zero non level. And so we could say phi couples to u1 level 1. And what we have here is phi hat couples to u1 level minus 1. So the first thing we'll learn from that is that despite appearance, this theory if, if I did not mess up the algebra and if all our assumptions are true, despite appearance, the theory on the left-hand side is actually time reversal invariant in the infrared. So it has U1 level 1 on one side and level, it's dual to the theory with U1 level minus 1. That's already surprising. 
The second thing that is surprising is that if we turn on background A, let me write that more nice. The problem here is if I erase, it only looks worse. Yeah. If we restore A, we see that the A on one side couples with a plus sign and the A on the other side couples with a minus sign. And furthermore, for the duality to work, we need to add this counter term. So the duality without the counter term is not true. So if you set A to 0, you don't care. And you compute correlation functions, and they should be the same. But if A is non-zero, the duality is not true unless you also add this ADA on the right-hand side. There are many examples of such dualities that are true only if you add a counter term. So that's what we learned so far. Question? Yeah. So when we canceled the, the, the U1 level 1 on the right, is there nothing that we have to modify on the left to make that equal? No, it's a, it's a decoupled sector. It's a decoupled sector, so which doesn't do anything. N a, that's an excellent question. <laughs> Actually, the reason it's not completely decoupled, the theory on the left is the spin chain simons theory because k is odd. The theory on the right is also, as it stands, a spin chain simons theory because k is odd. So when I decouple that sector, ignoring the framing anomaly, in fact, I did not decouple anything. So this was all done in a lot more detail than I'm doing here. And if you gave me five more hours, I could have done it. But <laughs> <laughs> so the answer is yes, there is something on the left-hand side, but it's subtle, and we're not going to deal with that. Well, there isn't. The removing this thing or not removing it does not make any difference, except framing anomaly. And the framing anomaly really means that in addition to this ADA, we also have to add a gravitational churn Simon stone. That's the only subtlety. Once you accept that, then there's really no other subtlety. But I'm suppressing the gravitational churn Simon storm here. So we derive the new duality. And as always with dualities, we don't trust ourselves, so we check. <coughs> First, let's see how time reversal acts. The theory on the left is not manifestly time reversal invariant. The theory on the right is not manifestly time reversal invariant. So the only way this statement could be correct is, if, is that in the infrared long distances, the theory becomes time reversally invariant. That's the only way this, sorry? That's the only way it could be consistent if the theory on, if these two fixed points, it's clear that it, they both flow, if one of them flows to a fixed point, so it's true for the other because they're the same theory up to applying time reversal. Right? Set A to 0, and they're the same theory except the minus sign here. So if one of them has a fixed point, the other one also has a fixed point. And now we claim that if that is indeed the case, that fixed point is time reversal invariant. And T of A is minus A. And therefore, T of B should be minus B hat. And T of phi is phi hat. So in other words, time reversal acts non-locally. In fact, it's not even a symmetry in the UV here. But in terms of the degrees of freedom that we see with the naked eye, time reversal acts non-trivially. Next, we would like to compare the monopole operators, right? What are the observables of this theory? Phi is not a good observable, because it's not gauge invariant. So we would like to make local gauge invariant operators. And the only thing we could do is have make monopole operators. So we look at the monopole operator constructed out of B. And from this thing, we know that it carries charge 1 under big A. Big A couples to it with charge 1. Here we have a minus sign. So it should better be that it's mapped to and B hat dagger, because now at least the U1 charge matches. But this cannot be the right answer. It cannot be the right answer for several reasons. What does the monopole operator do? The monopole operator will move a point from space-time. 
and we specify that B carries this flux of B around it. Then we look at this coupling, and we see that if we specify that dB integrates to something to 2 pi, then we have direct coupling to B, which means that this object is not gauge invariant. It couples to B, it carries charge under B. To make it gauge invariant, we have to multiply it, and in my conventions, this should be multiplied by phi dagger. Similarly here, we have to multiply it by phi hat dagger. So these are nice gauge invariant operators, and we claim that they're mapped to each other because they both uh, carry charge 1 under big A. These operators have spin. This is the next surprising thing here is that this is a theory of bosons. This is also a theory. These two theories are almost the same, except some signs. So this is a theory of bosons. But this John Simon's term, u1 level 1, I've already told you that if it had not been coupled to other things, it has a line which is a fermion. This means that the monopole operator of this theory is a fermion. It has been a half. Let me derive it. We specified boundary conditions for B such that of one unit of magnetic flux. So the monopole operator is as if we have a monopole inserted in R3. Now, phi is a scalar field. We charge 1 r relative to the, mag the gauge field for which we had the magnetic monopole. So I've already quoted this result of Dirac, that if you take a charge 1 particle, in the background of a magnetic monopole, there is half unit of spin in the electromagnetic field. This was known to Dirac, and it's still true. So what do we have here? We have some classical configuration of Bs, or semi-classical configuration of Bs. We take one phi quantum, and we stick it in. So this has no spin, this has no spin, but in the electromagnetic field, we have spin a half. So U1A is 1, and spin is a half. So we are going to give this operator a name, and we are going to call it psi. It looks like a fermion. So this theory, already at short distances, forget all the assumptions of duality and all that. We have the O2 model couples to a U1 gauge theory with churn simultum level 1. Without any assumptions, this theory has local operators, which have spin a half in their fermions. That's, that's just rigorous. This does not depend on any duality assumption. <coughs> and now we see on the right-hand side that the other theory also has spin a half operators. So we call it a fermion. Now let's examine the phases of this theory. So what are we going to do? We're going to deform the theory, say, by phi square. So before we started manipulating the theory, the starting point, which is up there, we mapped that phi square is minus phi hat square. This was the map of operators. So this theory has two phases, depending on the sign of phi square. And now I'm going to discuss the two phases. So we're going to say add plus phi square, which is actually dual to minus phi hat square. We know that we have to put a minus sign here because that was true before we manipulated the theory. So we just do the same deformation. And we ask what happens. So let's start on the left. Let's start with positive r. So we add it with a plus sign. So let me put it here, r, and put a half here. Let's first do the phase with r positive. When r is positive, phi is heavy, phi is massive. So we can integrate it out and forget about it. So this is gone and this is gone. We are left with our friend u1 level 1. So we have i over 4 pi, b db, and we couple plus i over 2 pi, 
BDA. And we complete the square and we worry about the frame oh we worry about the fra framing anomaly or we don't worry about the framing anomaly and we end up with minus i over 4 pi ADA. In other words, and B is now massive because of the churn simons term. So what's the spectrum of this theory? The spectrum is gapped in this phase. And at low energies, we are left with this ADA. What is this called? This appeared, having such an ADA a vacuum, a gapped state, with a non-trivial term for the classical background fields. This appeared by, in many, many lectures here. It has a three-letter acronym. The first of them is S, SPT, yeah. It's next, the next one is P. <laughs> <laughs> so in this phase, it's gapped. And we are left with this SPT phase. Let's derive that in the other side of the duality. So I'll make a line, just to make sure that we're not fooling ourselves. In the other side of the duality, the sign in front of the, of the mass term is negative. So phi hat is Higgs. Right? Phi hat has an expectation value. And therefore, what it does is that it Higgs b hat. And since it Higgs b hat, we just forget about b hat. And we are left with this thing, so we end up with the same answer. So this is a check. So for R positive, on both sides, we find a gapped spectrum with ADA with coefficient minus 1. So we derive the same thing on both sides. So phi hat is non-zero. This is in quotations. B hat is Higgs. And we are left with minus i over 4 pi ADA. OK, check. It's always good to land on your feet. And notice that the physics on the two sides is completely different. And yet, we end up with the same answer, which is one of the hallmarks of duality. So just as the, so what happens between the two sides, the Higgs phase of that is the un-Higgs phase on the other side, and vice versa. Let's do the other sign. So imagine R is negative. So now it's easy, because the two sides are just going to flip sides. So if R is negative, let's start on this side. If R is negative, phi is Higgs, it kills B. And since it kills B, we end up with nothing. So it's also gapped. And the effect, low energy effective Lagrangian, it's not an SPT phase. Let's make sure we get the same answer on the other side. Now, the sign is positive. So phi, is phi hat is massive. We forget about that. This is U1 level minus 1. In fact, we don't even need to complete the square, because this is a perfect square. So we also end up with 0. So what did we see? We see here that, first of all, we get the two sides give us this, the, the two sides of the duality give us the same answer, both for R positive and for R negative, right? We did four different computations, and we checked that the duality works. And on both sides of the transition. The spectrum is gap, but there is a difference in this the ADA term. We can do better than that and ask what's the spectrum. Oh, I'm going very slowly. Let's start here and say for
So let's start here with pi positive, with r positive. With r positive, we have this quanta of phi. We have the gauge fields. It doesn't matter. They address it. And we end up with Okay, so phi is massive, you can forget about it. The equation of motion of B tells us that B is essentially A, right, from the equation of motion of B from these terms, and therefore the phi quanta, which are massive, carry A charge, and if we analyze it more carefully, we see that the phi quanta have half integer spin. So they're basically created by the same monopole operator that is hiding here. And the same result can be obtained here. Here, phi hat condenses. It condenses, it creates vortices. The vortices carry a charge under B, flux, they have flux under B, and as a result, they carry charge under big A, and they have spin a half. So on both sides of the duality, both for positive and negative R, we have massive particles with u1 charge and spin a half. In fact, if you're a little bit more careful, we can see it's plus a half or minus a half. So all these Operator, all these states can be thought of as created by this operator. So we haven't said anything about this theory. We found two bosonic theories, which at long distances have the following properties. A, we claim they're dual. So let's summarize the properties of this infrared theory. We have two bosonic theories. One, you are the O2 Wilson Fisher coupled to a U1 gauge field with churn Simon's level 1, and another, the same thing with level minus 1. The coupling to the background fields is slightly different. This theory we claim, these two theories we claim A are dual to each other. B, B is not a good thing to say here. First, they're dual to each other. Second, if I apply time reversal transformation on this theory, it's shifted by this. Third, it has a relevant operator phi square. It has two phases depending on the sign. Both phases are gapped. On one side, we have an SPT phase with ADA, and on the other side, we don't have an SPT phase with ADA. The coefficient is zero. The theory has fermionic operators, this one, local fermionic operators, which carry charge one under the U1A, and the spectrum has, on both sides, have massive particles, with spin a half in charge one. And except the statement of the fact that there is an infrared fixed point in between, everything else can be established at weak coupling. So we don't need any assumption. So we just write this Lagrangian and analyze the weak coupling theory sufficiently carefully and we derive all these results. So what do we have here? We have a system that depending on the sign of R, it's gapped here with a minus i over 4 pi ADA. And here it's gapped with 0. And there's a fermionic operator, local gauge invariant operator fermion. And it creates fermionic particles, which charge 1 under A, both here and here. And we also claim that there, if there is a fixed point, that's the only assumption, that if there is a fixed point, then the fixed point is time reversal invariant. And the time reversal symmetry really exchanges these two things, these two parts, at the expense of adding such a counter term. So that's what we derived. And the only assumption is that there is a fixed point. Other than that, everything can be done to weak coupling. In the language of the first lecture, everything else is kinematics. The only dynamical assumption is that there is a non-trivial fixed point. Question, 
Have we seen such a theory before with this list of properties? Again, it has two gapped phases depending on the sign of some coupling constant. It has time reversal symmetry with an anomaly ADA. It has fermionic operators with spin a half and charge one. And in the two gapped phases, the excitations of these fermions with spin one, spin a half and charge one. Have we discussed such a theory in these lectures? Let me give you a hint. Discussed it yesterday. Yeah. Free fer or massless at the critical point. So that's an assumption. So we made assumption one was both the left hand side and the right hand side have a critical point. I didn't even say anything about what it is. And assumption two, which looks quite reasonable, is that that critical point is a free fermion. Blackboard is dual. So Ken and Trilligator earlier this week described various phases of gauge theories and how they have dual descriptions or they don't have dual descriptions. And you had different classes where different free UV theories flow to the same infrared fixed point. And then another one that the free UV theory flows to another free infrared theory. And that's usually the more dramatic and the more interesting aspect of duality, because not only do we flow <coughs> to the infrared to, to something we know, we flow to something which is free. So when we flow to something which is free, we essentially succeeded to solve the theory. Because at long distances, we know all the correlation functions. So now I can be very explicit. In this case, I claim that this complicated theory, the Wilson-Fisher theory coupled to a U1 gauge field, this is something that was studied in the 70s. The only thing we do is add the chern simons term for this theory, which is something that was introduced in the 80s. And now we say that this whole thing together, which seems like it should be more complicated than the ingredients, because this thing without the chern simons term is the same as without B. That's the particle vortex duality. But now we add the chern simons term. And the claim is that this theory flows to a free field theory at long distances which means that now we know what all the correlation functions at long distances are. So we take this composite object, which is quite complicated in terms of the UV degrees of freedom. We have an endpoint function of this. We need this and its dagger to balance the charge. And we know how to compute all the correlation functions. This is a very explicit statement. It might be wrong. This statement might be wrong. But it's very explicit, and that's the claim of the duality. And I motivated it here. And I motivated it in such a way that I wasn't even the one who said that. One of the students, I think, uh, where are you? You said that, yeah. And uh, said that, which means that you said that, so it must be true. <laughs> <laughs> now, one can raise a lot of questions here. First of all, what about time reversal symmetry? The UV theories are not time reversal invariant, but the claim is that in the infrared, we have a theory which is time reversal invariant. So that is the statement that time reversal symmetry at long distances is an emergent symmetry. This is very common. It's called either emergent symmetry or accidental symmetry. OK, so we can live with that. That's not too bad. Now, somebody could say, wait a minute. And in fact, somebody already asked me this question earlier this week. These theories have bosons. The theory that we end up with is a fermion. So this is kind of like bosonization. From a more modern perspective, we can formulate this theory which has bosons on any manifold. The theory which has many fermions need to be form needs to be formulated on a manifold with a spin structure. How can they possibly be dual? So answer number one, this bosonic theory also needs a spin structure to define it because it has an odd chern simons term. The same thing is true here. So we avoided an immediate paradox. In fact, now I'll make par parenthetic comment for the experts in the audience. 
these three theories, both this one and this one, and our free fermion, can be formulated on a non-spin manifold, provided this background field A is a spin C connection. And again, if you didn't understand that comment, ignore it, but it's again a consistency check of the whole picture that we can actually put it all three theories on non-spin manifolds. So that's encouraging. You know, every time duality you pass another consistency check, you feel much better. So we've already discussed the operators. We identified this operator and this operator. Now we identify it with the free fermion. And we can also, so the list of operators we had, OK, so now I'm going to write it this way. Phi hat MB is dual to phi, phi dagger, to phi hat dagger MB hat dagger. And that's also dual to the free fermion from here. We also had an operator phi square, which was dual to minus phi hat square. That we already had before. And the identification with the fermion says that is the mass term of the fermion. So we already we also identify this bosonic operator. Now, there's some confusion in the literature that I would like to clarify now. Following on work of Polyakov in, I think it was either late 70s or early 80s, there's a phenomenon known in condensed matter physics as flux attachments of particles. So we take a par particle phi and we couple it to magnetic to background field to dynamical field B and there is a churn simons term and as a result the particle phi becomes a fermion and that's known as statistical transmutation flux attachment it has many names and it is extremely powerful in condensed matter in fact what we see here we see exactly this phenomenon in the two sides. In fact, we used it. We said the particles are these phi's, semi-classically. But since they couple to little b, they acquire charge under u1 and acquire spin. This is the flux attachment mechanism. But the flux attachment mechanism does not make the claim that we are making here. The claim we are making here goes far beyond the flux attachment, because the flux attachment mechanism, and if you look at the proof and various derivations, assumes that the phi particles are classical objects. They are massive. They are non-relativistic. They are heavy. Here, we say that the phi particles are actually massless. They are strongly interacting. They are strongly interacting in, with this Lagrangian. And yet, we claim that the transmutation to fermion is still true. This is a far, far stronger statement, which could be wrong. In fact, I needed an assumption that there is a critical point there. And even then, I needed some assumption. But this is, this is a different statement. The fact that it is consistent with flux attachment is a consistency check. But it is a, very, a much stronger statement. That's also a valid thing. Now, if you assume that this is right, you can reverse the logic and run the argument backwards and derive the particle vortex duality that we started with. Again, this does not prove that this is right. The particle vortex duality is on much firmer ground. But now we see that if we assume this duality, we can derive the other duality. Now, in the 90s, first in field theory and then in string theory, and to some extent, well, to some extent also in this millennium, many dualities were considered. None of them could be proven. But there were many relations between them. So if you assume duality number one and two, you can derive three and four and the other way around. And this gave us more confidence in the whole picture of duality. It does not prove any of them. But it, what it does mean that, first of all, if any of them is wrong, 
a lot of the structure is wrong. And second, every time we land on our feet, we get more confidence that this is the right picture. So armed with this success, we would like to derive more dualities. And now we have a machine that produces dualities. We have this threefold theory, these three theories that are dual to each other. Every one of them couples to a background field A. Or we could start with a particle vortex duality. And we're going to do the same thing. We are going to add arbitrary counterterms of the background field to both sides, gauge something, turn the crank, maybe integrate out some decoupled sectors, and derive a new duality. So we can do it, of course, all day, because there are many terms that we can add and many things that we can make dynamical and many things that we can integrate out. And, but let me give you one a characteristic example. I'm going to start with this duality. Let me make sure I'm doing it starting with the right side. Okay. So to summarize, what did we learn? And that's in fact enough to assume one of the, which is the one I assume. I'm going to assume that I, psi bar d slash a psi, as it stands, is dual to, and maybe I'm changing notation from the other side, db phi square plus phi to the fourth, using the same notation, minus i over 4 pi b db, minus i over 2 pi b da. OK, we can also write another one with the hats. My pages are out of order. Yes, they are in order now. And I actually, I lied here. Good. So what am I going to do? I'm going to add counter terms to both sides and integrate out A. So I'll do it in, in one step. So I'll call it A. And I'm going to add here plus I over 2 pi A db. And I'm going to add I over 4 pi B db. Right? So I'm add, I added these terms with big A and big B. And then I renamed big A little a. So I have to do the same thing on the other side. So instead of big A, I write little a. And I'm copying the same thing from here. i over 2 pi a db. B, big B is a, b is a background field, plus i over 4 pi b db. Any questions about what I did here? Uh, not really, because I was, not really, because I wrote this thing here. The only difference between them is this term. So if I bring this term with a plus sign to the other side, it looks the same. Because right, this is a classical term. It has to be on one side of the reality, but not on the other, with the appropriate sign. So right, if, let's add, let's take this duality and add this term to both sides. It's still valid. So it's not present here, but now we have it with a plus sign here. And the reason I consulted with my notes, I wanted to be consistent with what I was going to do next. So the fermion is actually dual to that, to be consistent with my other conventions. Actually, the way I've set it up here, we had two phases with minus 1 here and 0 here. In my lecture about the fermion, we had two phases with plus 1 on one side and 0 on the other side. The difference between them is a shift by plus i over 4 pi ADA, so I could have implemented it here. I should have been more careful about this thing. But it's a good exercise to play with these things and move things from side to side of the duality. OK, so what did we do? We did the same thing. We took one of these dualities. 
we added counter terms, this and that, judiciously chosen. I uh, might have gotten the wrong sign. Indeed, I did. This should be a plus sign, because it should be the same sign as here. So we added these terms on the other side, and we turned little big A into little a, which means we made it into a dynamical field. And now we are in, again, this fortunate situation we were before, that A appears only here. So Greg was supposed to tell you that this is an aside, and I don't know whether he told you or not, that if you have a churn simons theory with two fields, call them alpha and beta. This theory is a trivial field theory, completely trivial. It has no framing anomaly. Uh, I think it even appeared in some of the talks this week. Maybe in, in Yuji's talk? One of the talks this week had that, I'm confident. That this, is, this theory is a trivial theory. We can think of alpha as being a Lagrange multiplier that sets the gauge field B to be 0. So I'm going to use it here. Notice that A appears here and here. It's linear. So what it means is the dynamical field little b should be equal to the classical field big B. So this thing tells us that B is little equal to the big B. So what, let me just collect all the terms here. dB of phi squared plus phi to the fourth. We have minus I B D B cancels this. And, and that's all we have. So this fermionic theory is dual to this one. So let's give them some names. What is this bosonic theory? We discussed it yesterday. Well, we don't even need to say ungaged. This is the O2 Wilson Fisher theory. This is the O2 Wilson Fisher theory. What's the theory on the left? It's QED. Admittedly, with some counter term. It's a fermion coupled to a U1 gauge field. So the theory on the right has been studied a lot. There's huge literature on this. It's very conclusive. It's a non-trivial fixed point with critical exponents that are known to extremely high accuracy. I forget how many significant digits there are here. And this was measured, this was measured on the space station, the critical exponents of this theory. The theory on the left is a very interesting theory. Again, huge literature on it. It's a single fermion coupled to a U1 gauge field. And its dynamics is controversial. People run simulations, lattice gauge theory simulations, and the dynamics is, is controversial. This theory is not time reversal invariant because of the parity anomaly. This is the hallmark of the theory, which is not time reversal invariant because of the anomaly, because A is dynamical. So this is QED. It's, people claim that it flows to a non-trivial fixed point. People claim that it has a gapped phase. And there are all sorts of crazy claims about it. And we throw in ours that not only is it, does it flow to a non-trivial fixed point, that fixed point is the same as the O2 Wilson-Fisher theory. Maybe we are wrong, but the statement is, is very concrete. Now, one might argue that this cannot possibly be right for the following reasons. First, this theory is not time reversal invariant. Well, this one is. But we already got used to it. This theory can become time reversal invariant at long distances. 
This means that if we deform the theory here by m psi bar psi, this is mapped under the duality. We have it up there. It's mapped to deforming this by phi square. So here, at short distances, we have here at short distances we have a theory which is not time reversal invariant because of the anomaly, and the mass term also breaks the time reversal symmetry. Time reversal is broken here by two effects. On the other side of the duality here. Time reversal is manifest. And the operator phi square is mapped to this. So the proper statement is that this theory, or oh, that's the claim here, this theory flows to a theory that has a non-trivial fixed point at long distances. That fixed point has an emergent or an accidental time reversal symmetry. And the fermionic mass term, which was defined in the UV, translates to an operator in the at long distances which is actually time reversal invariant under this new time reversal symmetry. That's the interpretation. The second thing that somebody could complain about is the theory on the right is completely bosonic. No spin structure, no nothing. What about the theory on the left? It has fermions. So I've already theorized where I, if you're not an expert, tune off for a second. The theory on the left can also be formulated on non-spin manifolds because if A, or more precisely a spin manifold that are not, a, that, but it's independent of the choice of spin structure, because of this business with A, it can be taken to be a spin C connection. So again, we manage to survive what would otherwise be in a failed consistency check. So there was a question here. Ah, what was the question? Ah. So we discussed this, we discussed that. <coughs> so in a similar way, we can do more exercises and add more terms and have more fun. Let me give you one example, one more example, which I think is, is the one that I particularly like. So every one of them exhibits its own fun and its own peculiarities. So that's why it's fun to do it. We can shift, we can do the same thing, start with the same uh, duality. Let, let me even start with the same equation. So I'm going to start with this equation that I have here, here. So it's the fermion with the plus. I might need, yep, I have the plus. Okay, so I'm going to start with this duality that appears here. Let me copy it so that it would be cleaner. My handwriting is even worse than Leonardo, if you can imagine. So it's, I apologize about that. So that we have i psi bar d slash a psi plus i over 2 pi a d b plus i over 4 pi b d b. And that's dual to d b phi. Fourth, and now I'm going to shift. My notes are not in order. I'm going to subtract from both sides minus i over two pi b d b. I'll do that also here. Let me write it differently. 2i over 4 pi. That's a more conceptual way to write that. ddb here. And I need to add a background field, a new back, what will be a new background field? i over 2 pi b dc. And I'm adding it also here, plus i over 2 pi b dc. So, so far, I haven't done anything. I just added classical fields. 
the tag couple to it. And now, I'm doing the trick that I always do here. Take the field B, and I make it dynamical. So I'm adding counter terms, and now I'm making the field B dynamical. So I use the eraser. So I make this into a B, and this is a B, and this is a B. And here I have minus 2, here I have plus. So that flips the sign here, and that becomes a little B. On the other side, we have this B. This is B, this is B, and this is B. Is it clear what I've just done? It's the same trick again and again. And I could have messed up the signs, but that's what I have. What do we see on the right-hand side? <coughs> on the right-hand side, it's again the same O2 Wilson-Fisher theory, coupled to a gauge field, which turns Simon's term level 2 or minus 2. So, right, what did we have before? We started with level 0, started without the gauge field. That was the O2 model. Then we added the gauge field. That was the gauged O2 model. Then we added churn simons to level 1, and that turned out to be a free fermion. And now we are interested in churn simons term level 2. So this is Wilson Fisher, or we said phi, couples to u1, level 2, or minus 2. What do we have here? We have, again, this situation I like, where B, A remains, but B sits only here. So I can complete the square. And it has coefficient 1, and if the coefficient is 1 or minus 1, this is a trivial theory. So I can do that. And what I end up with is I psi bar d slash A psi plus i over 4 pi a dA plus i over 2 pi a dC plus i over 4 pi c dC. And that's dual to this. And I can add the framing anomaly, but I didn't. So what do we have here? Before we discussed, we started with the free fermion. That was the first example. The second example was QED, namely fermion coupled to a dynamical gauge field, which we can think of as U1 level a half. And now we can have here, which is we can think of as psi, a fermion coupled to U1, level 3 half. Or maybe I have a minus sign. So this theory, a fermion couples to a U1 gauge field, so if the U1 the gauge, if there's no U1 gauge field, it's a free fermion. That we said is the Wilson-Fisher theory. So let me summarize all the theories. I have a little table here. Where is my table? Ah, here it is. So so phi coupled to U1 level zero is the same as phi, this is just the Wilson Fisher, O2. No gauge field. No dynamical gauge field. All right, so the gauge Wilson Fisher theory is dual to the non-gauge Wilson Fisher theory. This is known as particle vortex duality. This is known from the late 70s. If we take the same theory phi and couple it to u1, it was minus 1 in our convention. Oh, and what do we know here is that the monopole operator from here, the monopole operator from here is dual to the free scalar from here. That was earlier this week. Then we said the same theory, but with u1 level minus 1. The details are not important. That's actually a free fermion. And we had this thing that m, the monopole with phi dagger, is mapped to the operator psi. And now we have phi with u1 level minus 2. And we claim that this is the same as a fermion coupled to u1. 
Oh, and this theory was also the same as the fermion coupled to u1 level a half. And this is the same as u1 level 3 halves. So the phi of this, and it was also dual to the fermion of that. OK, so we have lots of dualities. The, free, the ordinary Wilson-Fisher theory is dual to a gauge Wilson-Fisher theory. So this is the gauge Wilson-Fisher. This, this is the gauge. This is the ungaged. And this theory is also dual to QED, namely u1 with level a half. Second, we change the level here to minus 1. And that's dual to a free fermion. And this theory is dual to a fermion with level 3 halves. And we can keep going. There are all sorts of relations. And the hero of the story is the monopole operator. The monopole operator has spin coming from here, from the level. That's something that you should have learned in Chern Simon's theory and also fo follows from the reasoning I said before by touching phi's. So the monopole operator here is the free fermion from here. Is the Fermi, not the Fermi, the, I'm losing my coherence. It also needs a monopole operator. So in QED, this is the local op gauge invariant operator. In the gate, in the free, in the ungauge Wilson Fisher theory, it's phi, it has spin zero, and that's the magnetic monopole. So in here, the order parameter. has spin 0. And here, it has spin a half. And here, it has spin 1. It acquires the spin from the level of the chern simons theory. This is quite interesting, because for the gauge wilson fisher theory, the order parameter is the monopole operator. And it's the standard order parameter of the ungauge wilson fisher theory. For u1, for phi with level minus 1, we said this is a free fermion. So the monopole operator is the free fermion, has spin a half. And for level 2, we find something that has spin 1. So if all the assumptions are right, this theory flows, which we have both a bosonic description of it and a fermionic description of it. So it's either fermion coupled to u1 with some level, or boson coupled to u1 with some level. Don't try to follow the details. They're all in the literature, so you don't need to take notes. But there is something here which is quite interesting. As we go up in the level, the order parameter, or the interesting operator that we're talking about, has spin. And the spin keeps going up. So here the spin is 0. OK, this is some interacting CFT, which has an operator of spin 0. That's not too shocking. Here we have a bosonic theory that the order parameter has spin a half. That's already quite surprising. And we said it actually the CFT at long distances is a free fermion. Here we have a theory that the order parameter, the magnetic monopole, has spin 1. And therefore, if this thing has the right dimension, what would it be? What, how do we call a special operator that has spin 1? Let me give you a hint. It was discussed earlier this morning by Leonardo. A current, right. It's a current. So if this current is indeed conserved, this theory has a global U1 symmetry. coupled to what I called C above, background gauge field C. And the monopole operators and M dagger have spin charges plus or minus 1 and spin 1. What does it look like it wants to do? Have you seen anything like this in two dimensions? 
was discussed this morning. Recall the two dimensions. We have a particle on a circle. At the generic radius, there is a U1 symmetry, say the left moving U1. And there are winding operators that have high dimension. And there are two of them, one with winding 1 and one with winding minus 1. And they have high dimension. Then we make the, the radius smaller and smaller. It's getting a little bit subtle. And at some point, we get to a special point, the self-dual point, and it was discussed today. What's special about what happens to these winding operators at the self-dual self point? I always gave away the answer. Conserved. It's conserved, yeah. What else? They do something much more interesting than just being conserved. And it was emphasized this morning. Right, UG? Yes. Yep. They form an SU2. So what happens at the self-dual radius, also known as the SU2 radius, the current, the left moving U1, together with the two winding modes, form a triplet of SU2. So the claim here is that the same thing is true here. This theory has at short distances a U1 that we see with the naked eye. It's the magnetic U1 symmetry. And it has monopole operators that carry charge plus 1 and minus 1. We can continue working at short distances where we're just doing kinematics. And, we're, and it's reliable. We know what we're doing. And we see that these guys have spin 1. So this theory, short distances, no duality, nothing fancy. This is the kinematic part. It has a global U1 symmetry and monopole operators that have charges plus and minus 1, the thing in its dagger. And they have spin 1. That's what we see at short distances. The duality is going to claim that if there is, again, a fixed point at long distances, that fixed point should have an enhanced SU2 global symmetry. Actually, it's SO3. And I'm not going to discuss it here, but this particular fixed point that we gave one dual description to it, another dual description to it, has two more dual descriptions, which I'm also going to put in boxes. It's a fermion coupled to SU2 level a half. And another one, which is the fermion of Wilson Fisher with SU2 level minus 1. So I didn't say anything about non abelian gauge theories, but you can repeat this whole story with non abelian groups. And the, nice, and the claim is that these four theories, 1, 2, 3, 4, a dual to each other at long distances. And the novelty in here is that these two theories have the full SU2 visible at short distances. These two Lagrangians have SU2 symmetry. So the SU2 is visible here. It's not visible here. The price you pay for that is that the dynamics is the dynamics of a non-abelian gauge theory, where here the dynamic is the dynamics of an abelian theory. And this whole duality web, all this web of dualities, argues that these four theories flow to the same non-trivial fixed point. And we have a lot of evidence that this is right. I did not discuss it. So what did we do in these four lectures? We covered parts of my notes. I also skipped. It's not that this is not the fraction that we covered, because I skipped about half of it. And I wanted to demonstrate two plus one dimensional field theories as examples of how to think about field theories in general. And I had various rules. You probably forget the order. And, but it's worth remembering all of them. First of all, start in the with the classical theory and really try to get as much mileage out of the classical theory as possible. What are the symmetries? What are the anomalies? What are the cla semi-classical excitations? What are the quantum numbers? Write tables the way Ken did in his talks. Analyze the anomalies the way Yuji did in his talks. Number two, if you're confused about the dynamics, go to quantum mechanics, because there is much less room to be confused. That was a 
rule two and rule three, maybe not in that order, was that whenever you have a global symmetry, couple it to a background field. And as Clay demonstrated in his talks, not only for global symmetries, even for scalar coupling constants, it's usually a good idea to view every coupling constant you see in the Lagrangian as a background field and explore what happens as you vary it, both as you vary as a, as a parameter, but also if you let it vary in space-time, because this can teach you a lot. So I think I'll stop here. That's my time. Where is the czar? Is, is it, this is it? This is exactly Right. I timed it well. None. 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 So from this point of view, none. Okay. All I said from this point of view is that there is a monopole operator. And if its dimension goes down to 2, 2 is the relevant number. If it goes down, it goes down. That's you can check in perturbation theory. If it goes down to 2, then what I said follows. So A, we need that there is a non-trivial fixed point, And B, we need that it actually goes down to 2. Then, part that I did not do, there is this theory. So we have a whole web of dualities with SUN and SON and SPN. And U1 and UN. So U1 appears both in dualities of UN. And it also appears in another, theory, in another paper where you discuss SON. So right, this is the same as SO2. And similarly, SU2 appears in the paper on SUN, but also appears in the paper about SPN, because this is SP1. So there are lots of dualities between them. And if all the dualities should be true, that, well, here we see the SU2, the global SU2 at, uh, at all distances. So it's obviously there. But for all the dualities to be true, they have to be dual to these two theories. These have to be dual to that. And there's a lot of evidence for that also. So as I said, we're walking on very thin ice. And as we add more dualities, we add a little bit more assumptions, but we also add more consistency checks. And it might be that this whole structure would collapse. It might be that part of it would collapse. But if part of it collapses, big parts would collapse, because all these dualities uh, are tied together. So recently, there was also a paper giving lattice constructions of these four theories, giving more evidence that they flow to the same uh, putative critical point with enhanced SO3 global symmetry here and here. The global symmetry is actually SO3, not SU2. I was careless when I spoke before. Uh, no, as far as I know. Before that, you could ask what happens when it has 3 half. Maybe you get enhanced supersymmetry. So this was discussed. <laughs> and there is a supersymmetric point in that case in the parameter space. So if you put here, instead of 2, you put 3. The parameter space has a point which is supersymmetric, but it's not the point that is dual to the fermion. There's a, there's a fermionic theory dual to that. And, but there are special points in the, in, the, in the parameter space, and the supersymmetric point is not the point which is dual to the fermion. So nobody promised it would be easy. But I really want to emphasize that there's a lot more that can be explored with the same tricks. And of course, there could be more tricks. And every time you throw in another trick, you know, this thing grows exponentially, the kind of things you can claim. It would be absolutely fantastic to prove these dualities. Now, I'd like to put things in the historical perspective. I, yesterday, I had a 95 Tassi shirt. And I don't think it was in this lecture hall. Probably not. Probably not. Yeah, when the dinosaurs were roaming the earth and stuff, yeah. <laughs> and I spoke about duality in supersymmetric theories. And I was asked, is it true without supersymmetry? That was always the question. Because people didn't want to learn supersymmetry, so they hoped that maybe it would go away <laughs> and we'd just take the lesson and do it without supersymmetry. And my answer then, and I remember that very vividly, was 
I believe the answer is yes, but I don't know how to prove it. So here we are, a few years later. We have a very similar story without supersymmetry. So that's good. What I think I did not know then, and I still don't know, is how to prove it. And I feel that this will really, really be a huge breakthrough if any of these dualities are proven. So I think this will give us a lot of insight into many different uh, questions. And just as I predicted then that there are non-supersymmetric dualities, with even more confidence, I predict now that at least some of these dualities can be proven. And once it's done, I promise you, this will be huge. So. So for a billion theories, I know how to do, for, for a photon, I know how to do that. There's a change of variables in the function that go. Do something similar. <laughs> I'm not joking. I, I think, well, there are many interesting questions that in science, in physics, even in this in quantum field theory, I think this is one of the more concrete ones. I think it stands on the same level or almost the same level as proving that there is a gap in SUN gauge theories. So for among other things, you will prove duality in N equals 4. You will get new insights into ADS CFT. You know, all these things are connected. And this will really be, I think it will be quite a cool if you do that. Maybe I'm too old for that, but you guys are young and energetic. You have the whole weekend ahead of you. <laughs> That's right. Why do you call it dual? Because it's dual. <laughs> <laughs> but how are like testing in your cell? Why is it so special that Ah, well, is particle vortex duality okay to call it duality or not? Particle vortex duality as was first formulated and as I described it here yesterday is valid only in the infrared. That's an infrared duality. Now, is that on the universality? I believe the answer is no, because the degrees of freedom on one side are related in a non-local way to the degrees of freedom on the other side. Is it useful to think about the, non the infrared behavior using the two dual descriptions? The answer is very, very useful. That is now some 40 years old. When was it 79, I think? In fact, it's exactly 40 years. And hasn't, well, it, some people claim they proved it, and so on, but the, I'm sure it's right, and it's extremely useful. In th they, these are newer. They are not on the, as a firm footing as particle vortex duality. This is an infrared duality. It's not an exact duality. We have lots of examples of infrared dualities especially with supersymmetry, and they have taught us quite a lot. So this is the same thing. We have much less confidence than in the supersymmetric dualities. In supersymmetric dualities, we can compute a lot more. Here we can compute less, and there's this whole business of first-order transitions that does not occur in supersymmetric theories, yet it's here. And you have the whole weekend to prove that it's true. Okay, uh, for our last round of applause, I just want to acknowledge all of this week's speakers, Dan, Tom, Yuji, and also uh, some of your scientific organizers, Leonardo and Nadi, who sort of headed up the whole thing to bring this message. So thanks very much.